get through that quick so we can talk more about the the COVID issue. Um, but uh, so so you know this is this is the tri cities Cancer Center logo uh, changing um, in the near future. But uh, this is sort of our throwback. Um, I'm here to talk about radiation therapy in the COVID-19 era. I've expanded the topic a little bit because um, it's important to know, you know, obviously how the radiation itself can be used to treat COVID or at least some of the uh, manifestations of COVID. Uh, but I also want to talk about a broader picture of what we're uh, what we're seeing happen with cancer care in general because of COVID. And I think that's equally important to understand uh, right now. So I'll start off with uh, the personal introduction and then the Tri-Cities Cancer Center, exactly who we are. I'll talk about radiation oncology um, and, and sort of uh, who what my specialty entails. I'm gonna talk about uh, the technologies we use and then I'll talk about radiation treatment uh, of COVID and then cancer care in COVID as I was sort of mentioning. So I am a local, I grew up here uh, in the Tri-Cities, um, went all the way through high school here. So graduate of Jason Lee and Chief Joe and then Hanford High, class 2001. And then uh, 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 during my uh, senior year of um, uh, high school, I toured the reactor and uh, sort of in, in lear I learned a lot about you know, radiation. And uh, one of the things that sort of fascinated me was that when they were creating the plutonium for the atomic bombs, they created some uh, radioactive byproducts that then they used to treat cancer. In fact, to this day, there's only one place in the United States that creates um, uh, radioactive isotopes or at least packages them uh, uh, for cancer treatment, and that's Isoray in Richland. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of fascinating. So it's part of our nuclear legacy. And this idea that radiation can be used not only to, to harm, but to heal was always very fascinating to me. And it's what led to my interest in radiation oncology. And so I went to WSU uh, with that in mind. Go Cougs. I saw somebody with the Cougar jersey in there. Hey, so, right here. Uh, I, I, uh, I like that guy immediately. Um, so I, I graduated uh, um, in 2005 with a degree in chemical engineering. And then I went to uh, across the country over to uh, New Jersey, where I... Uh, did my med school at Rutgers, um, and uh, I was a, a recipient of the Cadillac Foundation Scholarship, which supports uh, local healthcare um, uh, students. So that was a uh, that was neat to have that and to have some support from Cadillac um, when I was going through this. I uh, then uh, came after I graduated medical school. Um, I came back as close as I could to the Tri Cities to get some training. I had to do a one year internship before starting my residency, and the closest I could come to that uh, was Spokane. So I, I got to spend one year at Sacred Heart in Spokane, did my internship there, and then uh, back across the country again, this time to Washington, D.C., where I did my training at the National Cancer Institute. It's part of the National Institutes of Health. Um, so it's one of their, it's, it's about 50% of the National Institutes of Health. So it's there in Bethesda, Maryland, one of the suburbs of D.C. And that's where I did my training. Graduated uh, from residency in 2015 and uh, then came to your Tri-Cities Cancer Center. Um, the Tri-Cities Cancer Center, uh, I'm, I'm setting my clock so that I don't go over, um, by the way, and feel free to uh, to let me know if I'm, I'm running out of time here. Um, so uh, so the Tri-Cities Cancer Center, uh, we are, I'm very proud to be here. Um, this is a, a uh, picture of all the staff that are at the Tri-Cities Cancer Center. We employ 50 people. We are a nonprofit. Uh, we take care of everyone regardless of their ability to pay and have for 26 years. Uh, we have the most advanced technology. We have amazing support, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, and uh, and I, I'm just very proud of our team here. It's uh, I, I had a choice to make when I came home. There was uh, this clinic and then one other clinic uh, that was around and, and uh, both had offers for me. And I, I really wanted to be here um, having been uh, in the Tri-Cities growing up when the Cancer Center was started. Uh, I, I really had a, a fondness for it. Um, we uh, are a classic community-based care model. Um, it's the idea is keep patients closer to home for their treatment. And uh, so that's what we do. That's what we've always done. Uh, and one of the things we've done recently is expand out a little bit. We'd always served Hermiston uh, because they don't have um, a lot of the resources. They don't have oncology resources down there. So we started a clinic down there and we've been able to um, offer treatment there too uh, and, and keep patients kind of closer to home for a lot of their follow-ups and some of their treatments. 
Um, besides the, the oncologists here, we have a number of support staff. Jeff Cummings is our PA, he's fabulous. Um, and then we have uh, cl full clinic nursing and support staff. And then uh, one of the things that um, a big part of what we do is radiation therapy. So uh, we have the radiation therapists and dosimetrists and physicists all uh, here um, on staff. We also have an integrative oncology program that's uh, spearheaded by another local, uh, Lindsay Josephson. She graduated um, from Richland High uh, the same year I did, uh, the same year I graduated Hanford High. And uh, she's a, a naturopathic physician um, and with a specific focus on oncology. And then we have uh, also Lisa Rupvik is a part of our, uh, the head of our survivorship program. The idea here is that um, patients that get cancer when we treat them uh, more than ever before they're cured. And uh, that means that they uh, sort of live with uh, the long-term repercussions of, of the treatments and the diagnosis and what comes next. Uh, this idea of what comes next after curing cancer was not uh, as much of a big topic uh, even 20 years ago, but because we've made such incredible advancements, now it's a huge part of what we do is following patients long-term. And so Lindsay, or sorry, Lisa is, is part of that group. Um, we have a number of centers of excellence. Uh, it's, uh, we, we uh, are nationally accredited breast cancer program that, that took about three years uh, to get that um, uh, accredited. It's a very, very rigorous accreditation. I'm very proud of it. We also have similar uh, programs for thoracic and general urinary and also rectal cancer. That's a big part of what we do with a, a major colorectal surgeon here in uh, in the Tri-Cities. Besides cancer, I mean, cancer is what we do most of. That's always gonna be our, our primary mission, but we can treat a number of non-cancers as well. So um, I've, I've listed a couple here. I've got a couple on the other, uh, on the next slide as well. But these are, these are benign conditions. These are not cancerous conditions, um, but like for instance, you may have seen keloid scars. That's that, uh, the top left picture there. The top right is, uh, is what's called Dupuytren's disease or Dupuytren's contracture. It's the most common hand disease known to man, causes nodules in the palms and eventually causes uh, the, the fingers to um, curl into the palm. A lot of people think it's arthritis, it's not. Um, and uh, and that's, a, that's a common thing we treat. There's other sort of uh, benign conditions we can treat um, and this bottom right is showing an arteriovenous malformation, uh, which is uh, sort of similar to an aneurysm. It's something that we can treat and, and prevent from bleeding in the brain. Um, and then there's a lot of inflammatory conditions, and this um, leads into our discussion uh, that we're going to go through here in a bit when it comes to, to COVID. But uh, inflammatory conditions have been treated for a very long time with very low doses of uh, radiation therapy. Uh, specifically x-ray therapy. And so plantar fasciitis is one, uh, different sorts of arthritis, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, uh, epicondylitis, you may have heard of tennis elbow or golfer's elbow, that's what that is. And then on the right side, bursitis, um, really bursitis anywhere in the hips and the shoulders, all those things, uh, uses, uh, we can use low dose x-ray therapy to help uh, those conditions. And virtually all of them are covered by insurance. Um, at the Cancer Center, we have a number of support services, uh, nurse navigators, social workers, uh, chaplains, um, other sorts of uh, uh, support. For instance, a uh, patient may come to us uh, without insurance and needs to go out of town to get some kind of a surgery for uh, something that we don't have here locally. Most things we have here locally, but there's occasionally things we don't. And in those cases, we can actually give them gas cards and set them up for a hotel stay out of town to get that taken care of. That's part of our mission and it's part of what we've, uh, what we've been able to do um, with the generous support of our community. Um, so our foundation is a, uh, a separate wing of the, of, the, of the department here, of the, um, the center here, which is um, a 501c3 organization. And uh, if you guys have ever been to our autumn affair or our, our breakfast, uh, these are um, our golf tournament. Those are some fun things we do every year that are sort of help to raise funds for those sort of uh, charitable organizations, charitable donations that we give our patients. I'm going to switch gears a little bit, talk about what a radiation oncologist is. Um, and that's important to understand, again, this whole, comp, uh, this whole kind of diving into the COVID thing. 
So um, radiation oncology, we, uh, we affectionately uh, nickname it RADONC for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, we are a subspecialty of oncology. Okay, so um, uh, we are not a subspecialty of radiology. Uh, we, are a, a, uh, we are oncologists first. Uh, we are one of the big three primary disciplines of oncology. So if you think of oncology as a spectrum, you have patients that um, are, are seeing either surgeons, they see surgical oncologists or other surgeons that can do oncologic surgeries. There are medical oncologists, they do uh, chemos and other systemic therapies. And then there's radiation oncologists, which were the smallest of the three fields, but our focus is obviously on the radiation portion of things. Um, this is a direct pathway of training. We have the most oncology training of any of these uh, specialties, more than the, the surgical oncologist or the medical oncologist. It's uh, four years of dedicated oncology training. And again, not a subspecialty of radiology. Radiology is something where they read images, MRIs, x-rays, CT scans, something like that. Um, we are not part of that. Um, we, we used to be years and years ago, but literally it's been 50 years since we broke off from radiology. So that hasn't been the case for a long time. Radiation therapy is a local therapy. It only goes right where we point it. It's a lot more like surgery than it is like chemo. Um, it only goes right where we point it and it's accurate down to a submillimeter. So again, targeted and precise. I, I use the example, you know, the, you know, to compare it to chemotherapy, for instance, chemotherapy is something that is injected into the blood. It goes all over. The good thing about it is it doesn't miss anything. And the bad thing about it is it doesn't miss anything, right? So if somebody has some tumor on their toe, they're going to get side effects head to toe uh, in order to get that chemo there. Radiation's different. Radiation, uh, if, if we have a tumor on the toe, the only thing that's going to happen is the toe is going to get red. That's where, you know, that's, that's how radiation works. So um, it's, it's very targeted, very precise, um, and uh, our ability to control it and, and manipulate the beams uh, to get to where we need to has uh, changed dramatically. And I have some, some examples of that coming up. Again, we treat some benign diseases along with the cancers. Um, and, uh, and so the, we talked about that a little bit. Radiation is sometimes used to cure on its own. Sometimes, for instance, prostate cancer. Um, that would be one that classically we use radiation alone and we're done. Um, sometimes uh, surgery, sometimes chemotherapy are used uh, for those cancers instead. Sometimes it's all in conjunction. There are some cancers which require all three. So any combination of these things may be something that um, we consider depending on the case. Also radiation can be both external and internal. So um, the internal radiation, we call it brachytherapy. <clears throat> you may have heard of prostate seed implants. Uh, that would be this, uh, this, uh, these seeds that are about the size of a grain of rice. Again, this is something that Isoray makes in Richland. Uh, these go into different areas in or near a tumor and they help to, uh, to treat the tumor uh, locally in that way. Um, there's another type of uh, brachytherapy that uh, uses a machine and uh, it's called an afterloader. That's what that picture is on the left. And that has a, a small radioactive source also about the size of a grain of rice, but welded, uh, but about a thousand times more powerful than any one of these seeds that you would implant. And uh, it comes out, uh, it's welded on the end of a wire inside of that machine that housing unit there and it can be sort of snaked up through the head of the device and go into different things in order to treat a patient um, uh, based on, you know, again, um, various things that we may have to treat. Um, brachy is a, is a Greek word. It means short distance. And that's the idea is that this is actually a form of internal radiation. However, the vast majority of what we do is external beam radiation therapy. So this is completely the opposite idea. Instead of putting a radioactive source directly in or near a tumor, you're going to instead uh, treat from the outside of the body in using high powered x-rays usually, sometimes electrons, uh, sometimes protons and some others, but typically x-rays. Um, so uh, we have the most advanced linear accelerator known to man. It's called the Varian Edge. Uh, that's it on the left there. Um, and uh, basically what this does in a nutshell is it creates um, x-rays, high-powered x-rays through the, uh, the, the municipal power supply. It goes straight through uh, into the machine and then it converts uh, these electrons that come from uh, the, um, the city's power supply, it converts them into x-rays and then we can uh, shape the beam however we need to in order to treat whatever we are trying to aim it at. 
Um, it's very complicated. This picture doesn't really tell everything that's going on. Uh, for instance, if you look at what um, that table that's there, we call it the couch uh, that is sitting under the, uh, the machine. Um, that right there has a little like almost like an accordion thing under it. The idea there is you can move this table in six different degrees of freedom and uh, it allows us to sort of catch different angles of the tumor. Um, the machine itself and the head of the machine, um, well, it can move around almost 360 degrees. So you can match it. You can move both the patient and the machine in order to treat whatever it is we're trying to treat. Um, this is how the radiation uh, is collimated out of the head of the machine. So uh, there's a couple different parts to it, but uh, the main thing is we have these things called the jaws, which are the big metal uh, uh, blocks that sort of get the beam down to some smaller uh, useful um, size. And then from there, we can custom shape it even further with these things called multi-leaf collimators, which is that picture on the top right. These are individually driven, uh, they're, they're individual lead leaves that are each driven by individual motors, and uh, they can kind of uh, uh, sort of pop in and pop out and block different, block the beam at different points uh, as we're delivering the treatment. And so you can see kind of what that shows is the source that's ahead of the machine in this in this bottom picture here. Uh, it, uh, it it sort of shows the, the beam splays out like a flashlight. And we can use the multi-leaf collimator to block different areas, and then we can get it down to the, where the projection is is about the size of what the tumor would look like in that particular field of view. So just kind of show this again. Uh, let's say that that little gray thing is the tumor. This is what the MLCs can do to shape it. And it's even more complicated than this because uh, the machine, as you can imagine, every, the tumor looks different from every single viewpoint that we're treating. And so that shape is only true of that particular degree at which the, 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 the uh, machine is looking at it. And so from every single 360 degree pattern, those MLCs will adjust the entire time that that is spinning around the patient to treat them. So it's very complicated, but the whole idea is once you sum up all these individual beam patterns, you'll get the target that you want to. And so it shows us um, something like this. This is sort of shows, uh, this is a picture tells a thousand words. This is the old way of doing radiation on the left. This is the new way on the right. Um, the, the old way was called 3D conformal radiation therapy, and the new one on the right is called IMRT, or intensity modulated radiation therapy. So the idea here is that um, it, it, we're really trying to treat that shape on the right, but for years, we didn't have the ability to custom the beam so well, and so we would have to just draw boxes around things and treat a big old box in order to get the dose where we wanted to. We'd have some ability to customize it further than that, but nothing like we do now. So um, it took a very long time to move from that picture on the left to that picture on the right because of uh, a number of things. One was just technology. Um, it, uh, we, we weren't quite there in terms of how to um, sort of uh, create these lead leaves and, and make them so that they don't warp all the time or cause different problems. They're kind of an engineering marvel. And they're very, very difficult to, to sort of um, create and then have them be so reliable as to not break down every day. But the other part of it <clears throat> is that um, these create, in order to create a custom plan like that on the right, um, it takes billions of calculations and it wasn't practical with the old computers, um, but with the new supercomputers, they can do that very, very quickly. And so it's an, it, it, it used to take eight hours to run a plan like that. Now it's just a few minutes. And so that's the, uh, that's the other thing that, that has changed. Um, so uh, just mentioning our technology again, again, we have the radio surgery, we have the trilogy, and then we have uh, the different types of brachytherapy. We also do some, some stuff that's called unsealed source administration, which is uh, different sort of radioactive isotopes that are injected. So um, these are things that help treat bony tumors. Uh, we also have an oral form that's used to treat thyroid cancer. Uh, these are different sorts of radioactive isotopes that are used to treat. So. I'm going to um, kind of with all that in mind, okay, so we've gotten to the IMRT era, we've shown how radiation can custom dose different areas of the body. Um, this is something called whole lung irradiation, all right? This is something that's not done a ton. I did it a lot when I was in training. Um, I haven't done it uh, much since I've been out. If you, uh, if you look at this picture, what it's showing is that yellow part there, that's what's getting dosed. Well, first of all, let me, let me back up so that 
people know what we're actually looking at. So this is a CAT scan um, and uh, this is looking uh, different views of the patient. The most obvious one would be where their arms up in the bottom right looking straight on. And this is sort of um, as if you were to, uh, uh, you know, cut the patient down middle of the uh, middle of the head straight down their body like that. That's what we're looking at. Um, so straight on like that. And you can see the arms up on the sides there. Um, the dark areas there are the lungs. And you know that because they're full of air and outside of the patient. Uh, outside of their body silhouette there, you can see also that's all black because that's air as well, right? So um, those are the lungs and that's what the target is for whole lung irradiation, as you might imagine. Um, the little areas that are not shaded in any particular color that are just kind of gray, um, those are areas there we would call them cold spots, except for they were intentional. Um, that's where they're trying to block out the heart. And so you can see how we've been able to block out the heart with IMRT and treat all the lung, but also spare the heart in the process. That all makes sense? Okay. You guys still hear me okay? Yes. I'm assuming you would have said something if not, so I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> so um, this, uh, so this idea, um, so this is this is whole lung irradiation, and uh, the reason I don't do it a whole lot here in the Tri Cities is because we primarily use this for children. Um, it is used on a number of pediatric cancers. Uh, so, just to name a few: Ewing sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, osteosarcoma, Wilms tumors. These are tumors that um, are uh, are in children, spread to the lungs, and in those cases, we do have to give whole lung irradiation. Now, when we're giving it to these patients, not only are they very young where they're giving, where we're giving it to them, uh, but we're also um, trying to cure them and, and uh, usually successful. Actually, pediatric cancers have been one of the huge successes in cancer care over the last uh, couple of decades. They've, uh, they estimate that the improvement in survival of pediatric cancers has been 50% over the last 20 years. So incredibly uh, successful. And we think that's because we're treating so many of them on clinical trials and learning so much from each case. Um, there's also a lot of research money poured into pediatric malignancies, um, which is wonderful. So we're seeing a lot of really uh, big benefits there. But the idea here is again, whole lung irradiation, just like I just showed you before, the whole lung is treated and these are the doses. That's one thing I wanna focus on here is the look at the dose ranges here, okay? So 12 up to 20 gray is what we're doing here. Gray is an SI unit, it's a joule per kilogram. It's an amount of energy deposited into a mass of the of tissue in the patient. And that's how we generally will use uh, doses. There's other things that people talk about out there um, different sort of, you know, sieverts and REM and all kinds of things. Uh, but for the most part, we're using gray nowadays. Um, so this first one, let's say, take the top line here, Ewing sarcoma, 15 gray in 10 fractions, which works out to 1.5 gray per fraction. Um, and, uh, and then it actually increases above the 14 years old and they use 18 gray. So they get two extra fractions in that case. And what does that do for patients? Well, again, it's usually successful. Usually we're curing them. And uh, just to kind of give you a sense, this next um, page here is a trial looking at whole lung irradiation and uh, looking at uh, the, um, these are patients, again, treated as children for pediatric cancers. The doses are that first uh, red box that I've included there. Um, and uh, you can see the range of doses here. Um, this one includes 15 up to 20. And um, then on the far right here is lung toxicity. Uh, and this is a grade three or higher young lung toxicity. So um, we usually say a grade three is when you actually have to do some kind of intervention like a medication. Uh, and that's, uh, that is generally zero for all these patients. And understand this, are, this is with 20 plus years of follow-up. These pediatric cancers that we were treating with whole lung irradiation, you can see very little toxicity. There is one trial that's an outlier here. You see 12% grade three or higher toxicity, 12% that they had to do something about. Every other one of these studies was zero, okay? Here's another one on the other page showing uh, doses all the way up to, I think I saw one of them was 24, yeah, 24.8 gray um, on one of these um, studies. And that one uh, showed uh, that again, zero toxicity here, okay? So it also shows in the um, parentheses here what the dose per fraction was, 1.5, 1.5, very common dose per fraction. And again, toxicity out to 20 years or longer 
is showing very, very well tolerated treatment. Okay. So that's going to be important here in a minute as we talk about the COVID. So let's move on. So the big driver of mortality for COVID is actually what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, this is something that has about a 50% mortality rate. Um, it's, it's very scary. COVID is not the only thing that could cause ARDS. There's a number of things out there that can do it. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it's sort of similar to a pneumonia um, and it's caused not so much by the infectious agent, but it's actually caused by your body's reaction to the infectious agent. It's actually caused by an inflammatory reaction that your body has to the agent. So this is important to remember that it's not, it's not like, you know, the virus is running in there and, and, and causing all these problems. Um, I mean, it is, but it's not the virus itself that's doing it. It's your body's reaction to it. Um, and so uh, this picture on the, on the left here shows healthy alveoli. Basically, those are the air sacs where you're, you're breathing in the oxygen and going into those air sacs. And then the, uh, the blood is going around it and it's sort of... Um, uh, it's oxygenizing the blood because of um, the air exchange that's happening. However, when all this is blocked up with fluid because of inflammation caused by your body, um, kicking up this, this, um, this fluid to fill the air sacs, there's no way for oxygen to get in. And when there's no way for oxygen to get in, there's no way for oxygen transfer to occur. I've got another picture of that um, that shows another aspect of this in, in another slide. So, Change gear for a second. Let's talk about the history of using radiation therapy for pneumonia because it actually goes back all the way back to 1905. Um, it was used, it was shown to be an effective treatment for unresponsive pneumonia. Um, it was, uh, it was a, a, a low dose of radiation. It's uh, not an expensive treatment uh, when looking at a population basis. Um, all of the radiation treatment in the entire country done in a year is lower than the cost of any one single uh, chemotherapy agent that you could name. So it is a, it is a very, very cost effective modality. Um, there was a landmark study published in 1924, uh, 243 patients uh, using x-rays for pneumonia, and they found that uh, there was a, a huge benefit. Mortality dropped significantly from 30% down to 5 to 10% in these patients. And um, you can see there was a lot of times when the radiographic evidence showed, showed improvement as well. So this led to radiation being a mainstay of pneumonia uh, treatment uh, into the, uh, starting in the 1930s. So what changed? What, what do you think happened at that point? Why did we stop using it? Somebody? Uh, if you're talking, I, you got to unmute first. All right. Well, I'll just assume you all knew, but it's... Uh, Penicillin really was the big one. It, wow. We got in through and we got antibiotics. Well, antibiotics are great. Um, they helped with a lot of these, um, but what's the big downside to antibiotics? Well, some people can't tolerate it. That's uh, you know less of an issue in a situation like this. But the main one is that it's um, antibiotics only work on bacteria. It doesn't work on, on viruses. So um, it, it wasn't something that was really gonna help um, everybody in those situations. So radiation is still used for a lot of the uh, viral infections. Uh, but in general, what it is, and this happens across the, the spectrum of healthcare, is that um, you know, your, your one treatment gets better and then a competing treatment gets better. And so that's what happened is that all these other treatments sort of followed suit and that some of them actually ended up kind of dethroning radiation as an option. So it wasn't used as much anymore, even uh, as late as the 1940s, it was kind of falling off. They'd still use RT and those that couldn't take the drugs or didn't work on them. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it, it was sort of phased out for the use of, uh, of pneumonia. It's still used for a number of anti-inflammatory or a number of inflammatory conditions, um, and including in our clinic, um, they continue to use it uh, worldwide uh, for all these different kinds of inflammatory conditions we talked about. And why is it used in those situations? Um, it's because um, radiation, after you know doing decades of study on its effect of cancer. The most sensitive cancers to the effects of x-rays and radiation are leukemias and lymphomas. These are cancers of white blood cells. White blood cells are what mount the inflammatory process. They're what cause these issues. Again, like I said, it's your own body attacking itself. And so radiation can actually stop these because if you for, sort of 
you know, just point it to the area of pain or inflammation. Um, you dial it down the doses to uh, very low doses that we would use for leukemias or lymphomas. You, um, you trigger uh, a, a reaction in these white blood cells where they stop attacking itself. So this is the anti-inflammatory effect of radiation. Uh, it triggers something called apoptosis in white blood cells, and it causes these to these cells to sort of burst. And um, it's a programmed cell death. And uh, and then um, it, it has been wildly successful for all these anti-inflammatories. Um, so the idea is, could it be used to treat pneumonia and ARDS specifically? Not so much the pneumonia. Again, it's your reaction of the pneumonia, which is the ARDS part. Um, this mortality that we're seeing in COVID. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the big thing is we don't have a treatment for COVID, right? I mean, well, we don't necessarily know of any good uh, treatments for COVID. Nothing has been uh, established yet. And so it's not like we can give them, there's no competing treatment here. I mean, there's supportive care or there's maybe this. So that's one of the big things to consider is that we just don't have the competing treatment yet. Um, at the bottom right here, you'll see this is a thickening of the alveolar wall, and that's where the air exchange would take place. But again, with the fluid building up, it's not allowing this, this uh, transfer of the oxygen across the membrane into the blood. And so that's the ARDS issue again. This is thickened because of the white blood cells attacking this area here. And again, maybe potentially a target for radiation. So let's see. Well, turns out some people took the initiative. We started talking about it immediately upon COVID coming uh, out as a field. We started talking about using this uh, treatment for um, attacking uh, the, um, for, for, for the ARDS associated with uh, COVID. And so um, this was a study that was just published. This is the one that you guys had mentioned and the reason you invited me today. And uh, it, it looked at um, a very small number of patients treated in Atlanta at a major center um, uh, with, uh, with this low dose of x-ray therapy for COVID. So let's go through the trial a little bit so you can understand. Guy? Yeah. Guy, go back to that past uh, screen, please. Yeah. So in the, uh, in the names in the middle of it here, there is uh, Hess, uh, Buchwald, and then William Stokes. Yeah. We had a William oh. Stokes speaking to us last week here. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Is that, uh, is that we have some smart Stokes? people. <laughs> uh, I don't know them, but I, I, knew, I knew of them. And so it's kind of cool to see that. Yeah. All right. Um, so, um, so they took, um, these are patients that um, had, uh, had a reaction to COVID. Again, they were getting ARDS and inflammatory issues and uh, associated with it, with, with the COVID. And um, they, they enrolled these patients um, that were very sick and uh, they gave them a single uh, fraction of 1.5 gray whole lung radiation. Okay. So remember that was what every one of these pediatric cancer cases got in one day, right? And none of them got just 1.5. All of them got up to you know 12 to, to 20, right? Most of them got 15. So most of them got 10 times this dose, right? And then we followed them for 20 plus years and we found almost no toxicity, right? So now we're talking about a situation where these people have, uh, they're so sick that they don't have any other option and, and we've got a lot of discussion on whether or not 1.5 gray is going to be healthy or is going to be okay for them. Of course it is. You know, I mean, you know, granted, we don't have every bit of data we need to, to make that claim, but I mean, that's pretty compelling. So they took, um, again, eligible patients were those that were hospitalized. They had to have supplemental oxygen. They were clinically deteriorating. They were going downhill. Um, and what did they find? Uh, they screened nine patients. Five of them were treated with this whole lung irradiation. They followed them for seven days. Median age was 90, okay, 90. Um, four were nursing home residents, multiple comorbidities, as we know is another risk factor for, for death from COVID. Uh, and 60% within 24 hours of getting that one dose of radiation were weaned from their supplemental oxygen to regular air. A lot of them had improvement in their um, mental status. And one patient, uh, there was a, so that a total of 80% improved on their oxygen because the other one, they waited a little longer and by 96 hours had been weaned off uh, their oxygen. 
uh, mean time to recovery was 35 hours, and there were no toxicities of any kind that they could find. So not surprising, again, we had this data indirectly with the pediatric literature, but this is a, this is a, um, at least it's good to, to know this. Guy, have you uh, administered this uh, treatment to any COVID patient here in the Tri-Cities? No, we're gonna get to that. <laughs> we're gonna get to that. So, um, so again, this is a small trial, five patients um, that uh, had rapid improvement from this. Um, and it shows that this is promising and safe. And the conclusion was this warrants further perspective, uh, further study on a prospective large trial. Okay. So we have the capacity to implement. I mean, this is not hard. This is actually quite easy to do. I mean, 1.5 gray, we could bring them in um, and, and they would be out of here in an hour getting their treatment. And I think it's, it's uh, you know, uh, so we have the capacity to implement just as well as this place in Atlanta that did it. And, and it potentially could save thousands of lives, but there are barriers to it. Um, you know, the chief concern is, is I think, um, you know, sort of one that, that gets thrown out a lot, which is first do no harm, which is important. I mean, right, that's, that's the Hippocratic Oath. That's what we learn. You know, you don't want to do any, that's the first thing you, you, you talk about is that don't do any treatment that's going to harm the patient. Um, and, and I get it. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's another side to this, right? I mean, it's, uh, sometimes the harm is in withholding a treatment that may be helpful for patients. And so it has to be considered in the context. I, I have plenty uh, of, of uh, experience on this treatment and knowledge on this treatment to say um, there's no reason why it couldn't be uh, offered, okay, um, from, a, from a do no harm standpoint. Um, there is um, this theoretically low risk of causing cancer. Again, uh, this is a theoretical risk. Um, uh, it, it, it has been seen in pediatric patients, but they are more sensitive to radiation effects anyway. It's more of a carcinogen for a young, uh, a young patient. Um, and this is a laughably low dose. So we would never expect that. And if it does happen, it doesn't happen for 10, 20, 30 years. So, I mean, this is something where, you know, you got a patient who's uh, going to, going to, probably pass away within a few hours or days with, if you don't give them the treatment, I don't think there's a lot of downside there in, in that respect. Um, the one that has been mentioned a lot is, well, then that just puts our staff at risk. But, you know, a lot of our patients are going to have, um, uh, you know, I mean, we haven't had this issue yet, but I mean, COVID, COVID uh, testing and, and the positive cases is going up like crazy. And this is something that's just going to happen. I mean, we're, we're already taking all the precautions we need to as if every single one of our patients has COVID already. So um, I don't think that's a big issue. We have the proper protective um, protocols and uh, equipment in order to mitigate this risk. Um, one of the big ones, um, which we can't deny the reality of, is just a reimbursement issue. Um, we, we, uh, uh, we have a lot of cancer patients that are being treated and um, the staff have to be paid somehow and we don't know of any reimbursement mechanism for this uh, because it is so new. Um, it takes a long time for the government to step in and say, oh, we're going to pay for this. Now, this one's interesting because where I trained at the National Cancer Institute and right across the street at Walter Reed uh, Military Medical Center, um, they have no reimbursement issues. They have no, they don't bill and they have been doing this because of this, because this barrier was removed. Um, in our situation, we haven't, you know, quite gotten there, uh, but it's uh, it's certainly something that um, uh, you know we're 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 working on and trying to tackle either through our foundation uh, or you know or trying to find some other way to to deal with it. Dr. Jones, what yeah. what uh, would this procedure cost if I had to have it? What would the bill be? A um, few thousand, maybe. It's hard to say. Um, uh, I would say it's probably looking at may ballpark 5,000 maybe, um, you know, uh, which, which is significant for a lot of people out there, right? Yeah. Obviously. So, um, it's, not, it's nothing to, nothing to sneeze at. Um, so, so I'm going to, um, so I've kind of talked about the COVID and the, and the low dose x-ray therapy for it and that sort of thing. And I, I think it's an exciting thing. I think that again, case by case, you know, if somebody tells me, Hey, look, we got this guy, he's really sick. He's in the ICU or, or, you know, maybe just, just looking to go into the ICU at this point, very close to it. Um, he's got no other options here and he really is motivated to try this. I'd be like, you know, I think I'd be on board with it as long as the other options have been exhausted and, and this is not, you know, I, I know this is not going to hurt them. Um, but, um, you know, you're going to end up with, um, 
you know, uh, people on the other side of the coin. And I know that, I mean, I, there's people in my profession that just don't feel like that's the right thing to do. I had, um, before this paper came out from Atlanta, when they were just sort of, uh, uh postulating this idea, 4% of people in my specialty in a poll, 4% said they would offer this off of a clinical trial, 4%. So that's not a lot, right? Um, that's one in 25. But once this came out, it rose to about 50%. So, um, you know, we're still on the edge, 50-50. Um, I want to kind of change gears real quick because I do want to make a really uh, a solid point about um, what this is, what the impact that COVID's having on our cancer patients um, and, and just sort of bringing back into, there's three main pillars of cancer care. There's early detection, um, there's uh, the treatment itself, and then there's survivorship, um, which is that follow-up piece. Every single one of these things has been um, severely inhibited by the COVID issue, okay? Um, for a month there, we saw almost no patients. As soon as this thing happened, everything locked down. Well, that cancer wasn't going anywhere, and it came in with a vengeance a month later. Horrible cancers that I haven't seen for years. Um, and uh, so that was the early detection piece. All the screening got shut down. Every get checked up for things that they probably should have. Um, and, and so that affected it. The treatment itself um, has been affected because patients didn't want to come for their treatment or wanted to delay their treatment because of this. Um, and, it, and they thought it put them at risk. The risk was far more of neglecting the cancer, but you know, that's not, you wouldn't get that impression just by looking at the, you know, the, the daily briefs on COVID every day. And then the last thing is a survivorship piece that patients weren't coming in to be checked up afterwards, after they were done treatment, they just kept pushed, putting that off as well, surveillance scans and whatnot. And so they were getting caught later as well. There's also an emotional side to all this. Um, you know, patients actually suffered because they didn't have as many of their loved ones around um, because everybody in their family was worried that if they were around, they were gonna get COVID or expose the patient to COVID. And there's some, probably some truth to that. Um, but um, it, it is a really important part of, of cancer, of the cancer journey. I can tell you that with absolute certainty that a patient that comes in that has a supportive family uh, and, and other support system around them, they do better. And they have not had that with this COVID going on. Uh, some of the hospitals are in complete lockdown. They can't bring anybody else in. So we have the precautions in place. A patient should not be uh, neglecting their cancer because of concern for COVID. Um, we will um, we will take all the necessary precautions so they're not put at risk. Uh, but it's important to get the word out um, to the through a community group like this about it. Um, so that's all I have, guys. Um, uh, that's uh, this is one of my favorite little memes that came up a while back. Um, as a radiation oncologist, um, so hopefully you enjoy that. And uh, happy to take questions. Dr. Jones, uh, you, you had there on your slide that you could treat rheumatoid arthritis. Is that, uh, yeah. uh, what about stenosis of the spine? So, um, no, because that doesn't tend to be an inflammatory condition. That's more of a structural issue. Uh, it, it, it usually has to do with uh, the, the uh, bones in the, in the spine kind of uh, sort of um, uh, tightening up the holes in the bones where the nerves go through, they've kind of tightened up. That one usually needs to be surgically repaired um, unless there's some other inflammatory condition that's causing it. But if it's true, like typical stenosis, it doesn't help as much. But it would treat rheumatoid arthritis. Yes, yeah. I have a similar question about um, cellulitis and the inflammation of cellulitis. Yeah, so potentially. Chronic. Potentially, but cellulitis is another one that's very well treated with antibiotics. Usually, I mean, we have a lot of most good, of the uh, time, right? And and but I mean, if you get the right antibiotic on there, there's stuff. So they'll start with some like Keflex, like Cephalexin, and then if that doesn't work, they'll move on to you know Erbapenem, Minapenem, Vancomycin. Like they got mm -hmm. so many options that we don't end up usually going to that. Um, in theory, though, in theory, though, any inflammatory condition like that, yes. Um, in, in the problem with cellulitis, though, is that, um, you know, it, this is going to um, sort of help the inflammatory process and the pain associated with it, but it won't do anything to the bacteria. Um, right. Radiation, unless you drive the dose up really high, you don't kill bacteria with it. Bacteria are very tough to radiation. Right. And I see that Cheatham has her hand up. Cheatham, do you want to ask your question? Oh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, is there any study 